Okay. Okay. You want to buy a lens? You want to play rough? Vintage lens? Okay. Say hello to my little lens. Is. probably still in it now, where the word vintage was thrown in front of anything to make it sound more appealing. Vintage furniture, shabby chic. Vintage wedding video, pissy yellow. Vintage this, vintage that, vintage everything. One of the most hackneyed terms I've ever heard of in my vintage life. The definition of vintage Denoting something from the past of high quality, especially something representing the best of its kind. Now the vintage typewriter that I just saw on eBay going at seven pounds and 50 pence was far from the best in its kind. But the lenses that we use really are. But what is it about vintage lenses that we love so much? I don't know. Why can't we just use our normal lenses and make the footage look vintage? I can't even say the word vintage. I hate it so much. Of course, there are thousands of probably overpriced vintage LUTs that we can get our hands on. But this isn't Instagram. And why fake it when you can have the real thing? Now, when we talk about vintage lenses, I would say the top three names you will hear would be Leica, Zeiss, and Canon or more specifically Leica R, Zeiss Contax, and Canon FD. So profound, I almost forgot what they were called. Now, I'm by no means an expert on these lenses, but that said, I have used all three of those big names. And I've also spent hour upon hour upon hour upon hour upon hour trawling through the internet and eBay and various second-hand lens sites trying to find myself a bargain. Now I say bargains, the popularity of these old bits of glass has grown massively in recent years and that's down to them being easily adapted to mirrorless cameras. It's down to their cost, they're relatively cheap, they are fast, it's not unheard of for the standard lenses to be 1.4 or even 1.2, and they're generally widely available. Although people are really picking up on them, and they're disappearing, slowly but surely, into the darkness. When I first started researching vintage lenses about eight years ago, more specifically Canon FD lenses, there was nowhere near the amount of footage online or information online as there is today. But what I still can't find are any videos that contain just Leica R, Contact Zeiss and Canon FD footage all together. So I rounded up a few of my buddies who are equally as mad about vintage lenses as I am so we could get all of these lenses on some real life tests and show you some real world scenarios where we've used this glass and just cram as much knowledge about these lenses as we can into the next, 
well, I don't really know how long. But we might be here a while, so I would put the kettle on. It's tea time. Between us, myself, Ben Marlow, Paul Cook and Josh Birch, we have a set of Canon FDs, some Leica Rs and some Zeiss contacts. So we'll be looking primarily at these lenses. So what's all the fuss about? As mentioned, these lenses are old. They're cheap, mostly. They're fast, mostly. And they're available, mostly. There are thousands and thousands and thousands upon thousands of these little troopers lying around in the world somewhere which may just find their way into your kit bag. As Nick Morrison says in his wonderful Zeiss Contacts Buyer's Guide, when you are buying one of these lenses, you are buying a piece of history. This really does account for a lot of the allure of vintage lenses. They've made it through wars and political events, and as the decades came and went, these little workhorses were there. Little German, Japanese, and Russian workhorses. Around about the 70s or late 70s, autofocus and metering and auto aperture and all of these things started to come about. And of course, electronics were then built into these lenses. As the tech grew, so did the electronics. And these lenses became lighter. The materials became cheaper. And they all just became a lot more plasticier. What is undeniable about these lenses is that they have, in their appearance themselves and in the images that they create, character by the bucket load. And part of that character and what a large part of why these lenses look vintage is the coatings that they had on the glass. If you imagine that every piece of glass within a lens can weaken the light transmission by three to eight percent, by the time light travels through multiple pieces of glass, we could really end up with a very weak transmission indeed. Add slow apertures into the mix and we're fighting a losing battle from the get-go. Lens coatings were brought in to avoid light transmission loss and Zeiss were in fact the pioneers with their T-Star coating. But we will look at coatings throughout the rest of the film. Should you be concerned about coatings? Well, yes and no. Whilst it's important to understand what they are, it's also important not to lose sleep over it. The reason that these lenses are still around today is because of their build quality. They are built like tanks, which may not be everybody's cup of tea, particularly if you're into autofocus, light metering, or anything that involves electronics. You're not gonna be into these lenses because they are fully manual, of course. I'm using a Sony Zeiss lens currently with an a7 III with eye detection because I'm shooting this on my own and they won't do any of those things for you. But one thing is for sure, using old manual glass will really improve your skills. You've got to get it all right yourself. Manual aperture, manual focus and zero metering. But what are the downsides of using these lenses? As we've said, there's no auto functions whatsoever. There certainly aren't parts being made for these lenses, so if you break something, it's very difficult to replace. It's also difficult because you just don't know what you're gonna get. You can expect to find a little bit of dust on a 40-year-old lens, but there's other things that you need to be looking out for. There are the obvious signs, like dents on the lenses or scratches on the glass. A tiny nick on the lens isn't gonna be the biggest of your problems, but multiple scratches, like the ones that are on the Leica that I've just bought, should probably be avoided. And something that can be harder to spot is fungus growing on the lens. This can spread across all of your lenses and eat into the coatings and make a real mess of your pride and joy. It's widely accepted that you might have to buy more than one version of any one given lens until you get the one that's right for you. Buying lenses can be a really fantastic experience, but it can quickly become an obsession, as me, Paul and Josh and many other people have found out. I started out with just a couple of FD lenses to see what they looked like, fell in love with them, and now we have about 20. In fact, if you have an addictive nature, it may be best to switch off now. Okay, you're still here. Let's continue. Now we mentioned adapters earlier. Obviously you can't get a lens from 1975 and just whack it straight on your camera. You will either need to buy adapters or have your lens cine modded. 
When pairing lenses, we need to consider flange distance, which is the distance from the back of a lens to the camera sensor. With mirrorless cameras, we can fill the distance needed to make up the correct distance with an adapter. So for these cameras, adapters are a viable option, but having two connections between the lens and camera will slightly compromise the integrity of the mount. And of course, adapters are specific to each camera model. All cameras are different, so it's much more stable to have your lens modified by a specialist to whichever mount you would prefer. EF is by far the most popular. It's a similar process for Zeiss, Leicas and Canons, but some are a little bit harder than others. Or specifically, one is more harder than the other two. And that's the ones I bought, the Canon FDs. They can be a real pain in the ass. Now, the main thing with cine modded lenses is the modification of the actual mount. Mounting your camera is obviously essential. The next three are arguably nice to have, but not necessary. De-clicking the aperture. That's taking out the physical clicks by taking out the ball bearing inside the aperture, which gives your aperture a smooth turn which will allow you to change aperture on shot without it clunking. The next thing would be adding focus gears to the focus barrels, which is the little teeth that go on the focus barrel, which interlock with the little teeth on your follow focus, which makes focus a lot more achievable with these old lenses. And lastly, step-up rings. Step-up rings thread into the front of your lenses and will make all of your lenses uniform at your chosen diameter. The standard diameter for matte box is 80mm, so that's a common choice. And the internal thread of these step-up rings is 77mm, meaning that you only then need one size of filter across all of your lenses, which is really handy. We use Gary at CSP Pro for step-up rings, and these are the awesome custom-made caps he made for us. Thanks, Gary. Nice work, Gary. Ooh, look how it keeps on spinning. Spinning, spinning. Oh, well, there's no way to end. One, three. I want to nail this bit all in one go. The Canon FD lenses were around. The Canon FD lenses were in circulation from 1971 to 1995, originally for 35mm SLR cameras, meaning, of course, they cover the whole frame, making them, like the Leica R's and the Contacts, future proof. It was in 1987 when the EOS mount was born, and this really started the decline of FD production, being a much more favourable mount. There's something nice about knowing that these lenses have been around longer than I have in some instances. This longevity and undeniable build quality definitely has an allure about it. Flattering skin tones, beautiful lens flares, creamy rendering. That's so wrong, isn't it? I'm gonna take that out, man. I can't put the creamy rendering. There's just something so special about those flattering skin tones and beautiful lens flares not to mention the creamy rendering. These lenses were hugely popular and definitely the go-to lenses of that era. There were a huge amount made from the very wide fisheye focal lengths up to a 1200mm telephoto lens. The huge amount of FDs that were produced make them available and for the most part affordable. Although a recent surge in the popularity of these lenses has driven some prices up and up. For example, the 24mm L series, which I've just seen sell for £4,000 on eBay, which is pretty ridiculous, really. According to our chums over at Wikipedia, over the 21 plus years of production, Canon introduced 134 different FD lenses, ranging from a 7.5mm through to 1200mm in 17 different fixed focal lengths and 19 different zoom ranges. One of the most, if not the most, extensive manual focus lens lines ever produced. In fact, you can find a website called cameraville.co where you can find a list of every single FD lens ever produced. I got a lot of my information from that website when building my own set. 
I also got a lot of my information from a wonderful video produced by Media Division on YouTube, which really goes into the nuts and bolts of what FD lenses are all about, and I suggest you check that out. There are three main types of FD lens, the first one being the chrome nose. The chrome noses were made from 1970 to 1973. The chrome noses were then replaced with black fronts and remain so on all other FD lenses produced. In 1981, the new FD lenses were introduced. These lenses are often also called FDNs. The mount was changed slightly and more plastic was introduced, which a lot of enthusiasts are not big fans of. The FD lenses were somewhat pioneering with their breech lock system. If you are only going to use these on mirrorless cameras, then I would suggest buying as many adapters as you have lenses, because changing them can be a pain. If you use EF mount cameras, it might be worth looking into having them cine modded. There are a few ways to do this, but bear in mind that some FD lenses have the rear element of glass in the actual mount, so a lot of people won't actually touch them as they are indeed a pain in the ass. The glass, and more specifically the glass coatings, are a big reason as to why we love the look of these lenses. So on the front of the lens you will see either SC, SSC, or nothing at all. In 1978 the coating was no longer specified and almost everything had the SSC coating. The red SSC is definitely the more desirable of the two. If a lens doesn't have SC or SSC on there, it doesn't mean there's no coating. It just means that they haven't specified which coating is on it. I was definitely drawn into the allure of the chrome nose. In fact, the 35mm f2 was the second FD lens I ever bought. What I didn't know then, which I know now, is chrome nose just means that it was built between 1970 and 1973. So if you want some of the very first examples of FD lenses, then a chrome nose is the way to go. I started building my set of FD lenses about seven or eight years ago. I certainly didn't pay much attention to serial numbers. For a more in-depth look at the serial numbers of FD lenses, go along to Alan Watson Forster's website, which will tell you everything you need to know. I guess it's pretty obvious that a lens made in 1971 is going to look vastly different from a lens made in 1991. The build changed, the material changed, the glass changed, the coating on the glass changed. So when using all of my lenses together, I can see in some instances that there's a different look to each one. Does this really matter? I don't think so. If I have to do a bit of tweaking in post to get all of these lenses singing from the same hymn sheet, then so be it. Will a client ever mention it? Unlikely. Does it matter in the real world? I don't think so. In my set, there is a Canon FD 20mm 2.8, a 24mm f2, a 35mm f2 concave SC, a 55mm 1.2 SSC, an 85L series 1.2, and a 135mm f2.5 SC. So there's lots of dates in there, some SC lenses, some SSC lenses, some with nothing on them at all, some chrome nose, a real mixed bag of a set of lenses. It can be very easy to get caught up in the intricacies of these lenses. Coatings, SC, SSC, aspherical, non-aspherical, concave, non-concave, L-series, chrome nose or what year your lens was made in. At the end of the day, FD lenses are on the whole very, very good lenses. If you don't want to spend the earth to get yourself a set of cine lenses, then FD is definitely a good way to go about it. I first fell in love with vintage lenses when I first saw how the Canon FDs look, so I'll try not to be biased here. You can still build a decent set of Canon FDs fairly cheaply if you avoid the unicorns and the aspherical, outrageously expensive lenses. There's something about the look of Canon FDs which goes beyond vintage and I often find it difficult to explain the look but there's something about it and I love it. One thing the Canon FD range has is exactly that. There's a range. There's loads of different wides and fast wides at that. There's tilt shift lenses. There's long telephoto lenses. You're not short of range when it comes to Canon FDs. Canon FDs are very difficult to mod. You can try and do it yourself, but personally with 40 year old glass, I wouldn't trust myself. I would definitely send them into a specialist and specialists are few and far between. 
Again, if you play your cards right, you can build a decent FD set for fairly cheap. Good lenses they are. The first Leica R mount lenses came out in 1964. Originally designed for their SLR range and in particular the Leica Flex. So straight off the bat, it's good to know that when you're looking at Leica lenses, you're actually looking at lights lenses. Or also looking at lights and lenses. Because lights and Leica are the same thing. Now specifically, you can have lights Wetzler lenses or you can have lights Canada lenses. Lights Wetzler lenses are made in Germany, in Wetzler, and Lights Canada lenses are made in Canada. Leica opened up a factory in Canada, just in case something untoward would happen to their factory in Germany. It's also widely reported that the lenses are of identical quality, so there's not too much to worry about there. If you go onto Leica's website and go through their history timeline, you'll see that it dates all the way back to 1826, when a young mechanic called Carl Kellner started the Optical Institute, mainly manufacturing microscopes. It wasn't until 1864 when our guy, Ernest Leitz, gets a job at the Optical Institute. Within a year he becomes partners and within nine years he takes over the whole thing. Over the next however many years they end up making a lot of microscopes. But it's not until 1912 when Max Berek arrives at Ernest Lights and sketched out the first camera lens. It's not until 1986 when we actually see the name Leica for the first time. But why all the history? Basically, they know optics. Leica's pedigree cannot be argued with. A heritage adorned in luxury, quality and legend. When we look through the Zeiss set of lenses, and even more so the Canon lenses with their various coatings, etc., it can be a bit of a minefield, but with Leica it's all just so much more simple. Leica didn't talk an awful lot about coatings, so it's difficult to make a thing of that. The focal lengths are easier to understand, and the model names are simple and effective. Maybe this is just the German way. Simple, effective, and efficient. There's a lot less of a maze to find your way through when looking at these lenses. In terms of lens models, their name hasn't really changed, if at all, since their first inception. Leica lenses are named according to their speed. You have the Noctilux, which is f0.95 to f1.2. The Summilux, which are f1.4. The Summicrons, which are f2. The Summerits, which are f2.5. The Elmeritz at 2.8 and the Elmar at 3.5. Whereas the Sumilux will offer you a few more stops of light, it's important to note that it's widely regarded that the Summicrons are the best quality. Ken Rockwell says, More important than high speed, the Summicron offers the highest optical performance of any lens and remains reasonably compact at the same time. If you demand the sharpest Leica lens, it's the Summicron. The Summilux is probably a more sought after lens due to its high speed and, and fast lenses are always good to have in the bag, but it really depends on what you're shooting. If you've got light, I would say sharpness is more important. So what is it we love about Leica R lenses? David Battistella says on the Red User Forum, they have a nice look out of the box, really easy to grade, match nicely, and how do I say it? Not vintage, but not modern. Kind of timeless. I think that sums it up perfectly for me. The FDs for me look old. But whereas the Leica Rs still have that old feel and vibe to them, they can still hold up next to today's lenses. They are sharp and they look beautiful, but they retain that older look and are often described as having a creamy bokeh and dreamy blurred backgrounds. Nick Morrison, who wrote the Zeiss Contacts Guide, talks about these images by Bob Gundu. Bob, there is a wonderful softness to the highlights there. Love it. Funny how glass, only 20 years old, retains so much character, and yet is still very sharp and usable. Love it. Doesn't he just love it? As we've already discussed, serial numbers can be important when building a set of lenses, depending on what side of the fence you sit on. 
but like many things with the arts, it's subjective and a personal choice. But if you do want to match serial numbers, it's much, much easier with Likers, especially when comparing it to the more cryptic offerings from Canon. The Leica serial numbers start at 100,000 and move upwards from there. When I was building a set of Leica R's myself, I used Ken Rockwell's guide on his website. Whilst, as he admits himself, it's not exact, it definitely gets you somewhere nearer to building a set of matched lenses. But when you go down the road of matching serial numbers, this obviously limits you as to what lenses are available at that time. Most people set a couple of serial numbers and try and search for lenses within that parameter. For example, the ones I searched for fell between 2,900,000 and 3,100,000. That's a difference of around about five years, so you know you're going to get a pretty decent match. I've only just finished building my Leica set, so I haven't tested them much. So we're going to go and talk to my good friend, Mr. Paul Cook, a very talented DOP, about his set. Bosh. Who's this guy? So, Calvin, if you're gonna if you're gonna come and photobomb the shot, at least smile at the camera <laughs> and give it a wave. <laughs> he's he's all right. We'll leave him in. Um, so yeah, that million dollar question, Mr. Paul Cook, are you happy that you chose the Leica R's? <laughs> yeah, I'm. Uh, I'm really in love with my uh, Leica R set. It's already proven to be a great financial investment. Um, and you know it's it's already something that i've started to work into my quotes um you know i'm able to uh, use them on jobs and and sort of sidestep the the usual difficulties of hiring lenses and collection and drop off and having your own set of of cine lenses is um just such a relief when when you've been doing it for this long and and always having to rent or always having to kind of make do but um, yeah, I couldn't be happier with the with the Leicas really. There's some, like I said, sort of before. There's some lenses in the set that are without a doubt my favourites, um, yeah. and the ones that I might not have particularly um, expected to be my favourites. Um, you know, for for a while I was kind of wondering, you know, should I keep the 35 mm Summicron or should I really go on the hunt for the for the Summer Lux? Yes, it would set me back four times as much or five times as much. But is that the is that the lens that I need? Sort of thing. Absolutely not. Yeah. Summicron uh, 35 mm f/2. Absolutely beautiful lens. Um, have used it loads already, and it's the go-to lens in that set. If I um, if I just want to get uh, a really beautiful shot with you know this kind of magical swirly bokeh in the background, um, I've. I've Definitely seen that in a lot of the stuff I've shot with the 35. The 50 is just a you know a solid staple um, Leica lens. It's it's sharp, it's fast. Um, I've got the Summer Lux, which of all of the Summer Lux is the easiest to find and the most affordable. Um, you know, there's only a couple of other Summer Luxes, and they're the 35, which is insanely expensive. And there's the 80, which I do have, which is also pretty expensive. There is the debate about the 80 and the 90 Leica R's. Um, there's quite a big difference in price and there's not a massive difference in terms of the quality and the look. Um, you know, I'll be the first to say that I chose the 80 1.4 because uh, I've always wanted a fast 80 prime and I've actually never had one in, in any of my lens collections. And, um, you know, I think that that is, that is a lens which really does does do its price tag justice, but also the 90 f2, which I believe you have, um, yeah. is a really solid lens as well. Really sharp and uh, very, very nice uh, look to it. Being as fast as it is at 90 mil, you know, it's a great, it's a great image. It's that whole Summicron or Summilux ar argument, isn't it, really? And, you know, again, that comes down to what you're shooting. I think, you know, starting my career in the wedding game, if I was buying this glass then, I'd 100% be like, fast as possible, Summilux all the way, but those Summicrons are just super sharp, you know, so... Yeah, I think there's, uh there's very few people out there who would would say with any confidence that they always shoot wide open and that they always hit focus. Um, you know, that's that's highly unlikely. And, uh, you know, not everyone loves the super shallow look. Um, you know, as I say, I've really not been disappointed 
at all by any of my lenses, but particularly the, the 35, which is, uh, is the one that comes out on more corporate and commercial work than I, than I might have expected. Um, yeah. So I guess the, len the last lens in the set to talk about was the one that um, sort of eluded us both for a very long time and was a hard one to find, and that's the 19 mil. Um, because we got ours with, within less than a week, was it? Of yeah, we... Each other and randomly from the same, well not randomly, but for, from the same dealer as well, which was, um, yeah. which was quite remarkable when you go online now and see that everyone and his dog wants a, wants a 19 mil. Yeah, it's crazy to see just how rare they've become even in the last five, six months. You know, I've only been, I started in November 2020 and I think I'd completed my set by April 2021. So it didn't take me long. Uh, I feel like it'd take me a hell of a lot longer now to find the lenses that I did. I just got in probably right at the tail end of um, the jumping on the bandwagon, if you like, and the 19 was that last one that I found and I was kind of desperate to get my hands on one and complete the set because I, as you said earlier, you want to get the set complete and start using it. Um, and, you know, I went for the V1 because A, it was cheaper. B, what I'd seen online was that it was still a very beautiful lens, very, very nice to use has some quite interesting quirky flair um, sometimes um, and also the kind of the physical shape and build of it can be seen as a little bit of an issue um, so just to touch upon that really it's got an 82 or an 84 mil uh, front outside diameter thread so when you're trying to build a set like I have which is a 77 mil outside diameter front you actually end up having to get a step down ring but yeah it's just one thing to note but you know if you're looking for a 19 mil like it are chances are you're not going to find many of them to even have the choice um, so you may yeah, just have to make your decision and wait basically like is a pretty and i love a pretty image there's also a lot to be said for lenses that look great straight out of the box they're kind of vintage but kind of not kind of modern but kind of not i'd happily go and shoot a wartime epic film set in 1945 with these lenses but i'd also equally happily go and shoot a corporate film tomorrow that needs that modern look. Cine modding the Leica R's is similar to the Zeiss contacts. It's easy to do and you can do it yourself. And they just do look beautiful. They're the most expensive of the three, but reassuringly so. If you've got the budget for it, Leica R's are definitely a good way to go. And now onto the Zeiss contacts. Oh, it's your beard. I swear my beard's getting longer as we go through this video. I'm getting more vintage. Hit the vintage button. Zeiss had a very similar story to Leica in many, oh my God, this is ridiculous. So, uh, oh, Jesus. Zeiss had a very similar story to Leica in many ways. They're German also. They were started within 23 years of each other, Zeiss in 1846 and Leica in 1969. And they both 1869, you absolute tool. And they both started by making optical designs that weren't necessarily for camera lenses in the beginning. The codes and DNA. Leica with microscopes and Zeiss with magnifying glasses. In fact, I'm gonna come straight in with a link here. If you go to contactscameras.co.uk, there is a wonderful article in there explaining just what genius was involved to create Zeiss. A few searches online is all it takes for you to find out that there's actually a Leica versus Zeiss battle. Round one, fight! But I don't think we need to go into that here, really. We'll let the video examples speak for themselves. It's fair to say that Zeiss know a thing or two about optics. Zeiss lenses are often used on numerous other brands because of their optical performance. They still enjoy a partnership with Sony. Lenses that I've used a lot and I can say are technically brilliant. I've got the 55 1.8 up on that camera right now. And I can tell you that's probably the sharpest lens that I own. Going back a bit, we've got Hasselblad. And then another very big player in the game also used Zeiss lenses. That's right, Leica. 
The Contax grew to legendary status in the stills camera world. The Contax 1, coming out in 1932, enjoyed great popularity itself. After the war, design chief Wilhelm Winzenberg designed the Contax S, a camera that defined how SLRs would be built, even to this day. The Contax S also saw the birth of the M42 mount, another industry standard which is still in play today. Between 1949 and 1974, there was a whole bunch of rebranding for Contax, a failed partnership with Pentax, a whole load of political nonsense before Contax actually made that comeback in 1974 in the form of a partnership with Japanese photography giants, Yashica. The RTS SLR was created and of course, this camera needed a whole bunch of lovely lenses to go with it. Pair that with a fantastic line of Zeiss lenses and this makes for a very popular system indeed. The lenses range from fisheye focal lengths all the way up to the beast of a 1000mm mirror lens. All of them are manual focus and the very vast majority of them, I think, have the T-Star coating, the famed T-Star coating. When searching for these lenses, you'll most likely come across the name Jenna, as in Carl Zeiss Jenna. Similar to Leica, they use the name of where the plant was located and where the lenses were manufactured in the name. You may find lenses which are identical to each other in manufacture, but some of them have the Jenna name and some of them don't. To keep this very simple, if it has Jenna on it, it was made before the war. If it doesn't, it was made after. Again, similarly to Leica, Zeiss have their own language when it comes to naming their lenses. There are quite a few lens models available, but it's safe to say that some of the most popular are the Distagon, the Planar, the Sonar, and the Tessar. These are not necessarily named by focal length or aperture, more by the lens design. The quietly confident Zeiss contacts contained aspherical lenses in their lineup. They just didn't shout about it. We all know about the hype over FD aspherical lenses. It seems to have become the holy grail of lens buying, but it wasn't anything that these guys weren't doing at the same time. In 1935, Alexander Smacula, which is a great name, developed the first non-reflective coating for glass surfaces, making Zeiss the first company to actually put coatings on their lenses. There is a lot less ambiguity with Zeiss contacts, unlike with the Canon FDs. The invention by Zeiss of anti-reflective coatings that reduce reflections from glass surfaces in contact with air is one of the most outstanding innovations of technical optics in the 20th century. Where did I read that? On the Zeiss website, of course. It's a massive claim, but I don't think it's one that's unfounded. Because coatings are Zeiss's forte. Their claim to fame, their signature dish. Of course they excel, but the best thing about the coating is that it comes on the vast majority of lenses in the form of a little red T and a little red star. Lovely, lovely little red T star. The T star coating did at one point get an upgrade, but it's not really an awful lot to be concerned with. A lot of cinematographers do actually prefer the old coating. That's why we love vintage lenses, but it's nothing really to worry about as they all look absolutely beautiful. Beautiful. It's beautiful. It's impossible to talk about Zeiss Contax lenses without mentioning the famous or the infamous Ninja Star Bokeh. Ninja Star Bokeh is Marmite. You either love it or you hate it, it would appear. There's a lot of chat about why it's good or why it's bad or this or that. Myself, I don't have a set of contacts, but I can honestly say I think for my narrative stuff, I would absolutely love to see the Ninja Star Bokeh for sure. But then if it was something a little bit more corporate that I was needing to shoot, then maybe I wouldn't want to see it there. But again, it's all down to personal preference, isn't it? So maybe it's not really worth mentioning at all. Too late, I already mentioned it. I won't cut it out, or will I cut it out? I won't cut it out. Let's continue. There are a few other things that might need to be considered when looking for a set of Zeiss Contax lenses in terms of manufacture codes. Contax lenses come in two varieties, AE and MM. Again, very simply, AE lenses were available before aperture was controlled in the camera between 1975 and 1984, and MM lenses were made from 1984 onwards or until 2005 when they stopped making them. And all Contax lenses that were ever made were either made in Germany or Japan. So if your lens states AEG, 
It means it was made between 1975 and 1984 in Germany. And if it says AEJ, it means it was made between 1975 and 1984 in Japan. Mm. If your lens says MMG, it's an MMG lens made in Germany. Mm. If it says MMJ, it's an MM lens made in Japan. Mm. Now, talented director of photography and cinematographer and great friend of ours, Josh Birch, is the person who first introduced me to Zeiss Contax lenses and I love them from the very start. So we're gonna go and talk to him about his set, but before we do that, I wanna give a very special thank you. You what? Who cares? The very talented director of photography and good friend of ours, Josh Birch, was the first person to introduce me to Zeiss Contacts lenses, and I was smitten from the start. We're gonna go and talk to him about his set, but before we do that, I want to give a very special thank you to Yorgos Triafonas, or George, as he very kindly gave me his time and his unbelievably expert knowledge on Zeiss Contacts lenses. So thank you, Yorgos. I had Samyangs originally, which were good. They served a purpose, but I was just getting a bit bored of the kind of images they were creating wanted something with a bit more a bit more interest um, and I've always been a fan of super speeds um, having been around them a bunch of time with other DPs and stuff and I knew the contacts were very similar to them to a point obviously they're at sort of f4 f5 6 they're pretty much identical um, but obviously super speeds hold their own beyond f4 um, so yeah I, I decided that I don't really know why I, didn't look at Leica or FD in more detail. I just was kind of sold on contacts from the get-go. And in my classic Josh fashion, I kind of charged in and didn't do maybe as much research as I would have liked. I don't know um, what that's like. I always do complete research. Hold up. Wait a minute. Something ain't right. Yeah, so the only thing I didn't quite research enough was the whole AE versus MM scenario with the lenses which at the end of the day is not a big thing it just it's just a different bokeh essentially and if you're if you're okay with that it doesn't annoy certain people you know um but i eventually because I, when i did it it was that i think the 18 and 50 were the only mm ones i had the rest were AE, which i prefer i prefer the aes to the mns the ninja star bokeh doesn't bother me whatsoever i mean as i said to you off camera last week if if you're focused on what the, you know, the bokeh looks like, then it's obviously a bad video. You know, if your attention's drawn to that, it's not, it's not good. The AEs tend to flare a bit more white and a bit more wild, if that's the right word, a bit more vintagey. Whereas the MMs tend to be a bit more controlled. So it's all a personal preference. Again, if you if you like the old school vintage flares, go for the AEs. If you don't, MMs are your best option. Cool, and then, so your MM's the 18, is yeah. that right? Yeah, that's well. And obviously the, the big thing with contacts is at the wide end of things, we don't have speed. Mm. Um, have you ever been in a situation when you thought, damn, I really wish that this was F2 or F2.8? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, these lenses tend to be, where I have budget, I'll always rent different lenses because I just like to Mess it. I like to play around with different lenses for different projects, you know, create specific looks for different projects. But yeah, it's definitely been plenty of times where I've been on 18 and I'm thinking, I'd love to, love to have a, an F2.8 or, you know, even more, because I'm pretty sure the super speed's the 18's 1.5. So you, yeah, have, no, you, have, you have no problem when mm. you're at that wide end of it. Um, but it's not been anything that stopped you from getting work, has it? So No, no, exactly, yeah. I mean, they're usable, you just got to consider your lighting really I mean the whole seat it's, it's a wider shot so hopefully there'll be more light in the shot than if you're on the one that I have seen but I don't know if it's an AE version is I don't know if the 15 is an AE or not because I think that's F2A is that fisheye no it's not fisheye no, okay. but I, I, I know it was on this I know the 15 was uh, in the ZF range but I just don't know if it was in the MM or AE range I know the 21 you can get, which is F2.8, but I think having that couple of mil more 
is quite nice on the 18. Um, and then if I was to change anything else, I would try and get the 28 lens to the Hollywood lens, you know, the F2 version of it, because I've currently got the F2.8 version. Um, and then the other thing would be to have maybe a macro, mm. quite like a macro in the set, um, just for, you know, specific shots that you need. I've got one in Canada. I don't know when it's going to arrive here, but um, we, we'll definitely check that out when, when we do get it. I um, mean, uh, look. The box has, has been sat there waiting for that macro for God knows <laughs> how long, the eighth slot. Well, there you go, mate. When it yeah, comes, yeah. Uh, it, we can. It, it's got a home. Yeah. <coughs> but yeah, I mean, they, they all get used. But I mean, the one that gets used the least is the 135. Barely used it. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it's also quite cheap to acquire, so there's no point losing it really in case you ever did need it. I think they're uh, across, you know, like uh, contacts. And Canon, the 135 is like, you just pick one up tomorrow for yeah. 300 quid. It's like, yeah. it, they're, they're all the same, aren't they? Yeah, exactly. But I'm glad the the core of the lenses, the 35, 50 and the 85 are all 1.4, which is nice. Uh, on that point, the other option is that they do a 2.8, is that right? Yeah. So you can get the 35 and the yeah. 50 and, and all of that in the, the 2.8. I think, in fact, this one here, that's now the most expensive, you know, or one of the more expensive yeah. contacts lens to get. I think it is, yeah. I think the yeah. 50s are still quite a good price, but mm -hmm. the 35s are quite high in demand. I think there's a less Leicas about than there mm -hmm. is to contacts, but I think that they're becoming less available with the contacts slowly. So I do think they'll hold the value, and if anything, they'll go up in value. Well, as you see, you see people posting sets of them you know, for sort of near 10 grand on Facebook mm. now. I think the contact Zeiss lenses are some of the most underrated lenses out there. In many ways, they're more desirable than the Canons or the Leicas, yet they're the cheapest to build. They're easy to find, they're easy to mod, and they're easy on the eye. As the footage shows, they're true to life. And there's nothing wrong with footage that looks exactly like real life. I remember the first time I got Zeiss Contacts footage into the edit suite, and I was blown away by how sharp it was. My only gripe with the size contacts range is the fact that the widest lenses aren't very fast. But if you can deal with wide lenses that aren't fast, then you'll probably be okay with the size contacts lenses. As mentioned at the very start of this video, the whole point of this film was to get the Canon FDs, the Leica Rs and the Zeiss contacts next to each other on a real life shoot. And that's exactly what we're about to do. mil at f4 and of course Paul we did the same we shot at f4 for all the other lenses because obviously the other two lenses being faster but to make it a fair test we decided yeah. to go with f4 across the board yeah absolutely yeah I think it was uh, it was a wise decision really because you can't you can't go and compare um, uh, a faster a faster lens with a slower lens and uh, expect the same results obviously um, we would have had wildly different exposures as well um, and we would have had to have ND'd the faster lenses that little bit 
Um, so yeah, I um, this is this is definitely my favourite shot that we got for the um, lens comparison. Um, okay. Uh, I, I really is that because of the composition and how the shot worked out, or because of the colours, or why is that? Yeah, I think um, the composition, the camera movement, and the colour separation in the lighting is probably um, one of the one of the nicest features of of this particular shot. Um, it was really nice to get that separation of colour between the tungsten bulb and the um, colder daylight coming through the window. Um, so that was, yeah. you know, that was really nice to get that um, that difference. But yeah, just the com composition and the uh, and the location as well um, looks great. Yeah, I mean, the thing I found with contacts is that they, they definitely have a slightly lower contrast, and I quite like that, particularly on this wide shot. But in all honesty, from looking at three of them, they're very similar. It's very subtle differences. I think the Zeiss was a lot cooler from what I'm seeing. We're now at the Leica and obviously that's slightly warmer. Yes, um, yeah, I would agree. Um, I've found that to be the case across um, most of the stuff that I've shot f with Leicas and, and Zeiss, um, contact Zeiss. It's been very much uh, that slightly warmer edge on the Leicas um, and then uh, with the Canon uh, FDs coming up now, um, I tend to find that to be uh, another step towards warmer again. Um, there's a shot later on, um, which really demonstrates just how much warmer the the Canon FDs can be. Okay, yeah. So I was gonna um, I was gonna wait until that shot came up, but um, I may as well now that we're here say that's one of the old thorium glass that's on the glass. Um, so it's gone all yellow and it's super warm compared to the others. But anyway, we'll come to that. Um, I think what I noticed with this first shot is that the Zeiss and the Leicas were both sharper. I don't know if you saw that yourself, but I, f I found that when we got to the Canon, and depending on what you're shooting, that could be a good or bad thing, but I found the, the Zeiss, the contacts and the, and the Leica R's to be a lot sharper. Yeah, it's the, the FD does seem a little softer. Still very nice um, skin tones though, isn't it? Yes, 100% agree. I think that, that very first frame from, um, from the Canon was uh, noticeably softer. Um, and I would say that the, generally speaking, but you know, particularly shown in that first shot is that Leicas and uh, Zeiss are ridiculously sharp. Um, I think if there was any um, misconception about vintage lenses being softer or whatever, I honestly haven't found that to be the case yet. There's the, the old white flares from the contacts right there, which I like. I think they, they flare really nicely and quite naturally and organic. What are your immediate thoughts on this shot, Paul? Yeah, beautiful. Love love this 25mm contacts. Um, the veiling flare is amazing. Um, and, uh, you know, for me, it's the, uh, the nicest flare between uh, the Zeiss and the Leica um, off the mm -hmm. bat. Like, I know right straight away, because I know my own lenses, my 24mm exhibits a green flare. Um, yeah. I'm not the biggest fan of it, but it's, uh, it's a good copy of the lens otherwise. But yeah, that, that Zeiss 25 has beautiful flare. I, I really like the skin, I really like the skin tones there on that um, Leica 24. Yeah, yeah. And the FD, which we're coming up to now, yeah, it's, again, it's just a little bit softer, but that flare coming in now, I'm a fan of. I'm a big fan of that. Yeah, I am. Um, um, slightly would, more purple hue. Yeah, I would say, actually, you could throw this uh, this FD24 in it right into my Leica set and it would match better mm. than my Leica. Um, it's actually got flares and, and the color and, and, and um, sharpness of, uh, of the rest of my set. Um, I think it's actually uh, probably my, weirdly, my favorite shot, although I can totally agree it's a little bit softer, only marginally, but um, yeah. I actually prefer the FD in those, three, in those three clips. Yeah, so talking of matching lenses and colors, as we just kind of found out, the 35mm FD is one of the very early chrome noses. 
And as you've mentioned, it is a lot, lot warmer than everything else on this whole shoot. Um, and I left it in there. I kind of color graded it and played around with it just for my own peace of mind to know that I can make it look like the rest of the set, as you would do. Um, and it did, and it, and it came out perfectly. Obviously, just take, took a bit of that warmth out of it. But as you will see in a second, uh, it's a lot, lot warmer than everything else. Off we go. Yeah. I really so, love this shot. I love like the drama of it, how she's kind of got a, a bottle of booze and her head in her hands. It's, uh, it's a really nice shot, this. Yeah, it works nicely and it continues the colour separation from the first shot with the blues and the orange, sort of warmy, uh, warmer orange tones. But I think... Mm. Um, I, I think the, the Zeiss 35s, from, from my own experience with other Zeiss 35s, um, they are amazing. Um, and, you know, I think really um, it, it, it just goes to show that, you know, a 35mm and a 50mm typically do tend to be some of the nicest lenses in any set. It's just a mm. focal length that seems to be a sweet spot for a lot of focal lengths, um, yeah. for a lot of manufacturers, sorry. So I think, you know, the, the Leica R, I don't, I would say that this shot particularly doesn't do the Leica R35 uh, justice um, because it's easily my favorite um, in my whole set. And it was actually the first one I bought, and um, there's a little story behind that, but I won't go into it because, yeah, this this FD35, as you say, is massively warmer um, <laughs> by a, a few thousand Kelvin. Um, it is, and it looks great because it looks it looks just like sunset. Yeah, um, yeah. But in, it, you know, this uh, th this footage is going to be used in a film, and it's definitely not sunset where, when she's leaving that room. Yeah, uh, which is a real shame because I'd love to have kept those colours. But I agree with you, definitely. When you when it jumps from the the contacts to the to the Leica R, it, it just doesn't look as nice as the other two. Um, mm. And I'm, I'm similar with my 35mm Lycra, it's an absolute beaut, so um, I don't know if that was just my shoddy camera operating and maybe <laughs> I didn't expose it quite right, but it, you know, it's funny, isn't it? It's, it takes tests like these to see where each lens really does kind of shine. Yeah. So now onto the 50s and the 55. So straight off the bat, all three of these shots um, really impressed me from for sharpness um they are so sharp um and you know perhaps another test that we might have wanted to do would be to test them at, uh, at wide open sharpness but um definitely stop down um they all perform incredibly well for sharpness i think the for me the the contact zeiss has um nicer uh, out of focus bokeh um or bokeh i think it's just got the the edge on the leica there um and the fd i was really surprised how similar the fd looked to the other two lenses because I, I kind of always yeah. anticipated it being um that little bit more different and sitting slightly outside of the comparison, uh, but actually they were all really, really similar, and I think um, all of them performed amazingly well. Um, yeah, I think the main thing to draw for me from this, the 50 mil comparison, they're all very sharp, um, all pretty, you know, very similar. But the one thing that really stands out for me is the out of focus area on the contacts series. It just, I find it very pleasing. Um, the out of focus areas. Um, Skin tones and stuff are nice across them all. Um. Yeah, I was exactly the same. When I was watching the footage back, I kind of was struggling to kind of come up with, with any points other than they all just look so damn nice. So yeah, I was, I was chuffed with this shot. I was operating this shot, I, I remember, and um, uh, some of my, my framing was a little bit off at times, uh, trying to follow Ella's movement. Um, the slow moments. Well, let's, I mean, let's give you the benefit of the doubt because this is the end of a long day and it was really shoehorned in this shot, wasn't it, let's <laughs> be fair. Yeah, it's a little bit of a, oh, why don't we just grab that kind of a shot? And uh, weirdly, I think this first shot was the one I nailed it on the most um, and uh, managed to hit focus. And I think 
again there's there's elements to all three of these lenses that i love um the out of focus areas again the bokeh in the background um is beautiful but as we'll see as this as this shot comes up and you rightly pointed out there is a ninja star uh going on in the background um mm -hmm. which is um, i've got to get your opinion on that while we're there yeah for me it's a distraction um yeah. And uh, I was I was almost well no I wasn't almost I was gutted that I saw that actually my Leica 80, um, which we're now seeing, has a little tiny hint of a of a ninja star as well. Um, yeah, yeah. Considering the price of this lens, um, you know I paid nearly two thousand euros for this lens, and yeah. uh, you know it's just it comes with part and parcel of. Um, of buying vintage glass, I suppose. There's a, there's a risk that some of those aperture blades might have slipped a little bit over the years. Probably something I assume that you can get fixed um, by by um, lens sort of uh, lens services, but okay, there it's popping in there, yeah. Yeah, just there you can see it, and um, it's a little bit I less think, exaggerated. I think you've got to embrace it, man. You've got to embrace it. That's, uh, I mean, and and that's um, that's the thing as well. We always talk about Ninja Star, and it's always sort of uh, tagged onto Contact Zeiss, and obviously we've just seen here that it's not only Contact Zeiss lenses that have it. Admittedly, it's a lot more prominent, but um, but other lenses can get that Ninja Star as well. But I've got to say that this FD85L actually is a winner for me in the, in this test. I uh, love that flare that, that's just coming in there. Uh, and as Ella sort of moves her head backwards, but it's definitely a lot less contrasty. I don't know if that's just the copy, maybe a touch cooler as well, but I really do like the highlight roll off on that lens and and whilst the contacts and the Leicas both look lovely, I think that one does it for me. Yeah, I think um, I think the Leica 80 has uh, some real beautiful, unique qualities to it, and I know it's not always the chosen longer focal length for a Leica R set, but um, it's the one I went for um, just because mm -hmm. I I wanted a fast, long focal length, um, mm -hmm. and. Yeah, you point out there that the the flare on the Leica um, it becomes noticeable in this shot, and uh, I'm a big fan of the way uh, my Leicas flare. Um, yeah. But in comparison to contact Zeiss lenses, uh, again that veiling flare that they exhibit over what I'd call slightly harsher, uh, more kind of defined flare of the Leicas. Um, mm. I mean, I'm in two camps really. Like I love the way the Leicas do it for certain shots, um, mm -hmm. but then on, on other work, perhaps I would prefer the subtlety and the um, the softness of the of the Zeiss flare um, because that is um, that is something that you can get away with more. Um, I'll mm -hmm. sometimes have clients comment on the Leica flare. You know, it, it does come in over over their faces and stuff. And, you know, that isn't always something people want. And, no. you know, it has been a problem before. Um, but the FD and the Zeiss, as we've just seen, they do have that slightly softer flare quality to them. Uh, and I'm a big fan. Uh, I'm a big fan of both, both styles of flare. I think it just, you know, it depends what you're working on and and kind of how how much you want the flare to be a, a prominent feature of of the of the image, or whether you want it to be a very subtle hint of a flare. Um, it just depends on the work, really. 